Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ormark on the World Show. I'm your host, Devin Thorpe. I'm a Forbes contributor covering social entrepreneurship and impact investing. Today, we have a very fun guest. Uh, our, with us today is Lance Allred, who is the C, uh, founder and president of Mainstream, which is a social venture we'll talk more about. But Lance is also a, a former professional uh, basketball player. He spent time in the NBA with the Cleveland Cavaliers and was the first deaf player ever to play in the NBA. Uh, Lance, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Devin. I'm excited to be on. And are you getting any sort of uh, revenue from Google? Because I think you're the only one that's really supporting Google Hangouts and you have millions <laughs> of followers. <laughs> I think um, I would not be surprised if I hold the record for the most Google Hangouts. I think maybe the only people that have done more are is um, at the HuffPost Live. I think they use Google Hangouts for their show and uh, uh, and they probably have done more than I have, but I probably am number two to Huffington Post. I've done about 700 now. So, but Lance, sure, great to have you. Great to have you on the show. Uh, listen, tell me a little bit um, about your vision for mainstream. Ah, mainstream. So what has happened was when I retired from basketball last April, I turned into you know, motivational speaking, but I was speaking at corporate and nonprofit levels to get the funds that speak to at-risk youth. And I knew I needed something to kind of change the game because, you know, guys like Tony Robbins, Les Brown, they're not going anywhere. But there are also you being a speaker, you know, there's a lot of people out there basically being charlatans, just a lot of plagiarism. So it's kind of hard to get through the muck. And I came across uh, a good friend of mine, David Turkoff, who's the CEO of Nuvistack and also his president, Larry Harmer. And it's funny because everyone has an athletic background. Uh, Dave played in the Olympics with Team Canada. And Larry Harmer uh, played for the, uh, in the NFL for the Denver Broncos. And so you hear you have these jocks actually having this vision of cloud infrastructure and IT, kind of like doing a Revenge of the Nerds come full circle. And we're kind of coming into that world. And I saw what they were doing with a couple of other channel partners in mind. And I thought, you know what, guys? Education is my passion. Uh, I'm trying to speak to at-risk youth and empower them. And what you're doing by having this end-to-end -end cloud infrastructure service where we have the fastest internet in the world and the fastest data processors. I can speak all the verbiage as you want, but it's gonna fly over most people's heads. Um, but then we also have free endpoints. So it's like Google Fiber, but we offer more in that we have faster internet and a full operating system. So what I'm saying is, wait, so we can give every kid in the US potentially, and it will happen, Every kid in the U.S., this fastest technology that creates a level playing field for every kid, no matter what their socioeconomic background is. I asked them that, and they said, yes, that's true. I'm like, okay, let me run with this. I got it. Please trust me to do it. And they trusted me, and um, so I've established Mainstream as a channel partner for their companies and others, basically because they know it's important that the education vision has the autonomy to do what it needs to do without being beholden to capitalistic ventures or anything like that, that we're actually untouchable. And so it's really exciting what this is going to do uh, for kids. And it's incredibly exciting. So for what I described was, uh, was, a, was a mobile desktop kit. And so for every three that we sell, we provide one to a child in need. And obviously we want to, we want to improve that ratio, but even further than that, we want it to become an obsolete business model that, every school district in the US sees how valuable this is, that every kid now has an opportunity to do whatever they need to do. Now, I know not every kid's gonna take advantage of this, but if we're able to find one out of 100 kids, a kid in Southside Chicago, or in Compton, or Ferguson, or Baltimore, and they become the next Bill Gates because of they have now access, mission accomplished. Because we all know Bill Gates is Bill Gates because he had access, as the book Outliers told us. And so that's what we're solving. The greatest issue facing our youth is access. And so it's incredibly exciting. Give us a sense of what the offer is to your commercial customers. You're using kind of a Tom Shoes, uh, you know, yeah. buy one, give one kind of model. Tell us about what it is you sell to your commercial customers. Uh, the commercial customers, what they get really is we get every company out of mundane IT hassle forever. If you already have an IT staff, you can empower them to be more proactive. 
But like as far as onboarding, offboarding clients or customers or employees or uh, resetting passwords or upgrading your content software or hardware or scaling, all that tedious stuff that people just want to poke their eye out with a needle when they do, we do all that from the back end. And we allow companies to get back to what they really want to do. So my mom, who's a special education teacher, my father, a retired administrator, my mom's saying, Lance, this is huge because I spend half my day as a special educator, like trying to figure out this new software upgrade on the iPad that we have. We have to share them with all the kids. And uh, it's just so much work that I spend half my time being an IT resource instead of just being a teacher. So we're going to allow schools and or companies, everyone that has some sort of IT need, which is almost every company now, we'll take that off your plate and you can get back to doing the things you want to do. Give us all the boring stuff and we're going to be at least 30% cheaper on all of your storage data costs and also you're going to save on your electric bill because you don't have hard drives running or data storage running anymore. So you get a, also a tax incentive for going green, but also we get like medical offices and other sensitive data storage we get them out of hipaa liability and all other things i mean there's so much value that we create for everyone that relies on it education or enterprise that honestly it's it's it's, it's incredibly exciting but you know the, the tough thing is is that most people don't like change and uh, people are threatened especially i know there's a lot of it people that are threatened by me so they come after me right away like what does lance already this job know about it and I get to say, well, I can do this. But the funny thing, my main IT guy, Dylan Gale, who's a genius, he has a, um, a background in water polo. So there, there again, there's the athleticism circle coming back, back in. But he's kind of like the one protecting me now from the bullies because it's like, you know, the jocks beat up on the, the nerds in high school. Now they're trying to beat up on me. So it's a funny thing that I understand we're going to be threatening, but people are like, no, we're not taking jobs. We're actually empowering IT people to utilize their full creative ability and get them out of wasting their time resetting passwords and motives and all that stuff. So effectively, you're able to speed up the effective speed of a network. Isn't that part of what you do? Oh, yeah. No. Um, our, our speeds are ridiculously fast. So what happened, we had a little technical difficulty before this podcast even happened what you and I are doing right now, that my I still have to tap into a point of presence. So I was using my home Wi-Fi, and the home Wi-Fi went down. I'm like, oh, shoot. So I just grabbed my phone, turned it into a hotspot, and right now the phone only has three bars, and I'm still talking to you on my mainstream account on the yeah. fastest internet in the world. Yeah, and so it's incredibly exciting because, like, I mean, one time I was driving up to Pocatello, Idaho, in the middle of nowhere in Malad, Idaho, on I-15 with two bars. I started streaming a Netflix movie on my computer using my mobile phone as a hotspot. I mean, so it solves access no matter where you're at. If you can tap into a point of presence, you're good, and you'll never lose any sense of the data ever again. And you're primarily going after commercial customers, businesses, corporations. Will it be available for consumers as well? Oh yeah, no, definitely. Um, it, we're we're in a funny spot right now, like any startup company. That obviously we're going to our first major clients, so they can help us develop the templates. And once we figure out what are the appropriate templates for this uh, side of entrepreneurship, small business, whether it's a, a basic uh, tax accounting firm or a small medical office. And we're trying to figure out, okay, you know what? Help us create the world you want to work in, whatever you want it to look like, how big brother you want to be over your employees or not. We'll make it a very customized template. And from there, once we get the template set, it'll be a lot easier for individual consumers to go to the website and just click the app and download, bam, to have an account. And they'll get the endpoint mailed to them once they subscribe. Um, so I would say this will all be within a few months when we can actually – uh, universally duplicate all of our templates to just e even single customers and that'll that'll happen shortly but for now we're definitely in a stage where we're creating content that applies to each avenue of the economy fantastic fantastic well I, I want to just take advantage of the opportunity to have you on the show you know you, you've become a, a role model to a lot of people you have such an interesting background uh, you know, professional athlete, uh, 
you know, you're, you're legally deaf. You, you obviously are uh, functioning very well with the help of hearing aids. Uh, you. And I can that's on video chat, so it's nice. <laughs> yeah. And you're also, uh, you, you were born into a polygamous uh, sect uh, family when you were uh, uh, born, right? <laughs> Most of us were born when we were young. Uh, you were yeah. young when you were born, like the rest of us, but you had some interesting life experiences. Almost right. nothing in your experience would resemble a, a typical American upbringing, and yet you have been highly successful. Tell us a little bit about how you have become so successful. What do you think has been oh. the, the, what are the keys to your success overcoming the adversities you faced? Oh, you know, my parents are remarkable people. My father, when I was one, my father was supporting five kids in this socialist utopian polygamous commune, building houses for the good of the cause, not receiving a dime. And he broke his leg twice in the same year during construction accidents. So he said, you know what, I'm going back to school. And against the conventional wisdom, uh, spitting in the face of authority, really, my dad went back to school, graduated first in his class at the University of Montana, supporting his kids. And he did that by going on welfare for three years, which, you know, welfare, if it's used correctly, has its good points, and that's the way it should be used if there's a plan. And so my father used education to actually create a platform for us as a family to escape from polygamy. And so that's why education has always been very important to our family, both my parents being educators, my four older siblings getting academic scholarships. I was the lone jock in the family, but I didn't want to be a, a cliche athlete who didn't care about school because I realized, you know what, uh, I, my parents weren't, weren't going to allow that because no one knew about sports. So they say, if you're going to do sports, you have to make sure your grades are still good. And that was the, the work ethic that my father and my mother showed me when I was 19, my first year at the University of Utah. My mother was the commencement speaker. She finally went back to school. And um, just my parents showing me what hard work is. And my mother also taught me what accountability means. And accountability is a funny, funny word in that different people kind of have different definitions for it. And my mother, you know, she took my grandfather's advice that she shouldn't worry about the RH factor. And that's the reason why I'm legally deaf. I was born almost dead. And they finally took me to a hospital where I basically, I should not be alive, but that's a, that's a long story. Um, but I am here. And my mother, she could have blamed my grandfather or just been angry about why this or that, but instead, she took accountability by saying the only way she could ameliorate her lack of responsibility was to take accountability and make sure that I always went to speech therapy. I always wore my hearing aids because my mom would tell you I was a hellion as a kid. I would always try to take my take out my hearing aids, hide them, throw them, throw them in the in the baseboards of the garage, and my father was laying concrete. But my siblings were always watching me like a hawk because my mom paid them if they found my hearing aids. And so, but people always ask my mom growing up, how do you get Lance to wear his, speak, wear his uh, hearing aids? And my mom would say, it's, it's not an option. How do you get Lance to go to speech therapy? It's not an option. And of course, growing up, I resented my mother for that, but she showed me that is what accountability is, even though it was hard for her because I gave her literally hell twice a week when she took me to speech therapy. Now I'm so grateful looking back that I get to, actually function and communicate with the world when I know there's a lot of other people that hear better than I do, but they rely totally on sign, sign language. But when I was born in a polygamous commune in rural Montana, there were no amenities to learn sign language. So I had to be thrown in the fire and learn to communicate that way. And so it's funny now that a lot of people don't realize just how hearing impaired I am. And I always played basketball with my hearing aids out because of sweat issue, but also collisions. I had serious concussion when I was hit in ninth grade and shattered in my ear. And since then, I just didn't play with him in. And, you know, you just, I guess, Devin, to answer your question is that, you know, I use the line a lot that people have been telling me all my life what I can and can't do. I simply chose not to listen. I couldn't hear them anyways. <laughs> and because it's, it's, it's the only life we got. And so yeah. why, why let, people dictate the way it should be lived because all we know for sure 
this is the one life we have and um, I wouldn't do it any other way and looking back it has not been easy People yeah, think it's easy. I can only imagine I can only imagine well Lance you're clearly a role model to a lot of people who do you look up to as a role model oh man that's that's a that's a that's a tough one. My parents, obviously, and my grandmother. And I, I know this is such a simple story, but my grandmother in this polygamous commune, uh, one, there was one year I was living up there with my aunt and uncle, my grandmother, in fourth grade when I wasn't do, doing well here in school uh, in Utah due to bullying, and I was very, uh, very shy and introverted in elementary school. Um, but my aunt gave me this huge chore list, 95 thesis, basically Martin Luther, it was just ridiculous how much she gave me to do. And I was so upset, I was crying, like this is unfair, it's Saturday, it should have fun. But I was out there raking pine needles in the Montana wilderness there in this commune. And my grandmother came out to work with me and she said, you know, nobody likes work, but it's what we do. And I know that sounds so simple and trite, but the way she said it to me is like, you know, it is, it's what we do. That's our family lineage. That's our legacy. And so she's an extreme role model. And to, I know we try to be neutral, but Bernie Sanders is a huge role model with me too. And because that man, he honestly, of all the candidates left, he is, he, when you hear him talk, he genuinely just wants to be of service. Whereas everyone else wants power. And so I love that man. So those are role models that I can give to you right now off the top of my head. No, I appreciate that. I love your, I love your grandmother's counsel that, uh, uh, you know, we work because that's what we do. I, that's great counsel. As I think about your um, passion for education and for helping young people, uh, I understand why it's important to educate young people. Uh, but uh, I, I want to dig a little deeper on your connection to it. why you are so passionate about education. Oh, again, as I said, I'm passionate about, you know, because it gave our family the enlightenment and the courage and the permission to escape from polygamy when we had to. When I was 12, our family went into hiding when we left polygamy. And with that, you know, with great knowledge and understanding comes great responsibility. And you know, as Einstein said, the greater our circumference of knowledge grows, so too does the circumference of darkness around it. And so the more you learn in life, the more you learn how little you know. And with that education, I have been able to go and see a vast world. It's a big world out there. And I look back at all my cousins that were left behind and I think, you know what, if only they could have had the same opportunities, who knows what they might have been able to accomplish. And so I guess there's like almost some survivor's guilt, to be honest about it, if I can say that fairly. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it was education, as we know, is the great equalizer. And when I was in the MBA, I really thought I finally had a platform to reach out and help other kids, uh, whether with disabilities or not, socioeconomic as well. Um, but I wasn't there long enough to have the impact I wanted, and it broke my heart. Um, and so I'm, I'm just flabbergasted that now, six years later after that experience, I'm now in a position where I actually can help thousands and thousands of kids that would otherwise never be given the time of day and you know that's that's what we're here to do and um that's just i guess that's always been my personality the um, i've got a lot of flack from my siblings i'll sometimes saying lance you're too much of a giver and you get taken advantage of but i've learned the hard way that, you know givers are the least successful but also the most successful the trick is learning to surround yourself with the right people Surround yourself with people that also believe in paying it forward. And that's what I've finally been able to do. And this is, is incredibly exciting because, you know, I look back at the five-year-old me when I was in a Sunday school classroom, a teacher impressed upon me that God had made me deaf. It's a form of punishment. Mm. And so 
I had this messed up concept in my head of God and I had to earn his love and atone for some past sin that I had no recollection of. And even when we broke away from polygamy, I had this messed up um, dynamic, a belief with a higher power. And I thought, okay, I have to be the first death player in the NBA and they'll finally be proud of me. And so that was, that was a huge chip on my shoulder that I had. Plus, everyone always telling me, no, you're too deaf. You can't do that. You're not athletic enough. And, you know, Spite's a great motiv motivator as well, but it's empty mm -hmm. calories. Um, so I finally got there. And I remember in Cleveland, Ohio, I'm shooting a free, a free throw in front of 16,000 people. And I'm thinking, you know, is this it? Is this the best that it gets? Why don't I feel any different? Why don't I feel that God loves me? Yeah. And so when I, and that's, that's one of the things that we're taught in this society of ours through religious dogma, but also through capitalistic keeping up with the Joneses. You need this next car, this next job to be happy and all these Hollywood romances that teach us that, oh, happy endings really exist, triumphant musical score, kiss in the rain, end roll credits, and they could live, live to be happily ever after. But we yeah. know that's not how life works. But we've been shortchanged with that, so people keep going from event horizon to event horizon, trying to find their happiness. And I actually get to go and I talk to kids and corporate that, you know what? The myth that we have to earn love is the greatest con that we were ever sold. Love is either unconditional or it's not. And I get to go and talk to every kid and tell them, look them in the eye, you know what? I believed for the first 30 years of my life, I had to earn love. That I had to be a superhero to be worthy of love. And that is what so many of us I know experience. And that's where so much of this loneliness and angst and anger has finally started to spill over in our society. And that we're tired of the corporate status quo, we're tired of the politics, we actually want some honesty. And mm -hmm. that's something that I get to share with kids and you know, I see it resonate in their face, like, you know what? Yeah. And that's the greatest gift to me when I get to talk to kids, to teenagers that just get it and they yeah. understand what I'm trying to share with them. Well, Lance, uh, we're, we're out of time. Before you go, tell us how people can connect with you and learn more about Mainstream. Uh, so Mainstream.com, uh, but like a lion's mane, M-A-N-E-S-T-R-E-A-M, lion's mane, like Mainstream.com. Um, that, you can contact me through that company, but also you have my personal speaking website, LanceAlred41.com, but you can follow me on Twitter, LanceAlred41.com, or mainstream tech at mainstream tech and so uh, I'm available I'm not uh, I'm not uh, untouchable so I try to be as accessible as I can to people and I hope they know that great well Lance thank you very much for taking the time to be here with us today we wish you every success in rolling out your program to uh, provide this great technology to uh, kids in school Devin thank you for your time I mean your death please let me know if I can ever help you in return all right. <laughs> Let's do some good.